Thanks be to God. Well, do uh, keep that passage open in front of you, if you would. Um, we're uh, continuing our series looking at uh, the book of Acts in these days. And uh, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word, which brings encouragement, which brings uh, rebuke, which brings training and teaching to us. And we pray now that your Holy Spirit, who came down on that first Pentecost day, may come amongst us now as we sit in our front rooms, our gardens, wherever we are. Please, we pray, open our hearts and minds to hear and believe and follow your truth. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, some things go without saying, don't they? There you are, you're at home with, uh, with mum and dad, if that's uh, where you are. And it goes without saying that you love mum, you love dad. If you've got children, it goes without saying you, you love them. If you're married, it goes without saying, doesn't it, that you love your husband or your wife. Those things go without saying, don't they? And yet, things that go without saying do need to be said. If I were to go a year without saying to Chantal, I love you, things might start to go badly wrong. Things need to be said, even things that go without saying. And it's true in the church too. We cannot assume the gospel. Once we assume the gospel, we are in danger of losing the gospel. It's been said that the first generation is the generation that believes the gospel. The second generation assumes the gospel. The third generation loses the gospel. And the fourth generation opposes the gospel. I've seen it happen in my own family. My great-grandfather was a gospel man. I don't know a great deal about his life story, but I know that um, he left Nottingham, where he'd uh, been born and brought up, with a young family and went to America to preach the gospel. He was uh, clearly somebody who had the gospel of Jesus at his heart. That was in the late 19th century. But for whatever reason, the gospel was lost in the following two generations. And the truth of the gospel is always under threat in our churches. And we are to protect the gospel, not to assume the gospel. We're to protect the gospel, not by hiding it away in some kind of a bank vault as a treasure. But the way we protect the gospel is by proclaiming the gospel, by saying the things that sometimes we think, well, we don't need to say them. And that's why this chapter in Acts is so important. It's all about protecting the truth of the gospel. The Council of Jerusalem happened because all that Jesus had promised before he ascended into heaven was happening before the very eyes of this young church. The risen Lord Jesus promised in Acts chapter 1 that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And so when the Holy Spirit came on that first day of Pentecost, the story doesn't end in Jerusalem. The gospel of Jesus goes to Judea and Samaria. We see that happening in uh, chapter 8. And then to the nations, to people like Cornelius in chapter 10. And later as Barnabas and Paul start to travel across Asia Minor, they see many non-Jewish people turning to Christ. The Pentecost promise is becoming reality 
before their very eyes. But there's a problem. And it comes to the surface when some men come from Jerusalem to Antioch. Here is the church in Antioch and they're uh, chatting over coffee. And these visitors start to talk to some of the Gentile <laughs> believers, people who've come to faith in Antioch. And they say, well, it's lovely to be with you this morning. We've come all the way from Jerusalem to see you. And it's great to hear that you've trusted in Jesus. But listen, don't you know that there's something you need to add? If you're really going to be saved, then you need to add something to that faith in Jesus. If you want to be part of the church, then you've got to be circumcised according to the law of Moses. And no doubt these visitors from Jerusalem are very persuasive. After all, circumcision was a sign and seal of the old covenant. Abraham was circumcised. Even Jesus was circumcised. And if Jesus was circumcised, then surely, you see, you've got to be circumcised as well. Except that by adding to the gospel, they were distorting the gospel. A gospel plus is always a gospel minus. Start to add something, another requirement onto the gospel, and you lose the very heart of the good news. And that's why the church had to get this absolutely clear. It's why Paul and Barnabas entered into a sharp argument with these visitors. It's why Paul and co come down to Jerusalem and they meet with the Jerusalem apostles and leaders. And Peter the apostle sums up what is happening. Verse 11 of chapter 15, Peter says this, we believe that it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved, just as they are. In other words, Jew and Gentile come to Christ in exactly the same way. Salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, and not by works of the law. And so important is this message that the apostles and the whole Jerusalem church sent two of their own men, Judas and Silas, to go back to Antioch and beyond with Paul and Barnabas to let the Gentile believers know what the council has agreed. They send this letter which goes out with uh, their authority. And they want, first of all, to distance themselves from these visitors who've come to disturb the Antioch church. So verse 24, we've heard that some went out from us without our authorization. They had no right to go and speak to you in the way they did. They disturbed you. They troubled your minds. The word translated trouble is the word used when the bailiffs come and throw out all your furniture and possessions because you've not been paying the rent. These people have had their whole mental furniture turned upside down by these visitors. Because they were saying, Jesus is not enough. And now this letter comes from Jerusalem and it is saying, no, no, no. Jesus is enough. Gentiles do not need to follow the law of Moses to be saved. There is nothing you can do to change God's mind about you. That has been settled once and for all in the death of the Lord Jesus. And you do not put extras onto the gospel of grace. And that was a vital message for the church to get hold of as it became a church of Jewish and Gentile believers mixing together. Yes, the growth of the church as we see in Acts would need fearless, risk-taking ambassadors like Barnabas and Paul, people who were prepared to risk their lives for the name of the Lord Jesus. 
it would need to see godly leadership established, as we saw Paul and Barnabas doing in, in Asia Minor. But all of that would be fruitless and pointless without the truth of the gospel being absolutely clear in the hearts and minds of his church. And that is why we need to protect the truth of the gospel in 21st century Blackburn. When people look to add something to the message of salvation by grace alone, we need to say no. When people say you must believe in the Lord Jesus and then do something else or experience something else, then we must say no. Listen, for example, to the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. The Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church says this, no one can merit the initial grace which is at the heart of conversion. Moved by the Holy Spirit, we can merit for ourselves and for others all the graces needed to attain eternal life. Now that's a, a statement that starts well. No one can merit the initial grace of God. But then it says we can merit for ourselves. We can do something to deserve eternal life. Now, this is not a comment on individual Roman Catholics who may believe something quite different from what they, their, their church officially teaches. But this is the official teaching of the Roman Catholic Church. It is a gospel plus, grace plus works. It's saying that what you do is part of what saves you. We see it in other churches where an experience is added on to the gospel. You must have a second experience. You must speak in tongues. You must experience something different. But all of those things are gospel additions. And that's why if we are to protect the gospel, we must say no. There's no ritual to go through. There's no extra obligation. There's no extra experience that you must experience. We must protect the gospel. In our churches and in our own hearts. Because when we're not convinced that we're secure as believers, we will naturally want to add other things on. So we, we feel secure because we don't do certain things. We think if we don't look at pornography, or maybe if we have a daily time of personal prayer, then that will make us secure. Then we can be sure of God's love and acceptance. Or if we don't gossip, then our standing with God will be secure. But when we do those things, we're looking to relate to God, not just on the basis of the cross, but through the cross and something else. And we lose our joy in salvation because we're trying to earn it. And we lose our assurance of salvation because we're never sure we've made the grade. We're never sure that we've been accepted. Some things go said, but they need to be said. They need to be spoken. And as a church and as individuals, we need to keep, keep saying with Peter, it is through the grace, the free, undeserved love of our Lord Jesus Christ that we are saved. Whatever our background, whether we're Jews, Gentiles, black, white, Asian, whatever we are, this is the only way in which we can be saved. So that's the first lesson from this letter. Protect the truth of the gospel. And secondly, more briefly, protect the unity 
of the church. Do you notice how much care the apostles and leaders in Jerusalem take to underline the unity of the church? You see it in the writing on the envelope. If you look down at verse 23, it's labeled the apostles and elders, your brothers to the Gentile believers in Antioch and so on. They're saying, we're brothers. We're brothers and sisters. Yet, yes, we come from very different backgrounds, but we're brothers, we're family. And along with the letter, we're sending two of our own, along with Barnabas and Paul, to confirm by word of mouth what we're writing. It's so important that we want you to actually hear it as well as read it. We want you to know that Paul and Barnabas are, are not mavericks. They've risked their lives to tell you the good news of Jesus. And we want you to know that as a, a Jerusalem church, we are totally in agreement with the gospel message that they are proclaiming. And it seems good, it seemed good, verse 28, to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything there's no extra burden, but just these following requirements that we want you to observe as we work together as a church of Jew and Gentile. Yes, the gospel is all about God's free grace, but you Gentile Christians, please would you observe these requirements? And he mentions those four things, abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual immorality. These things are, are not entrance requirements. But the letter is saying, drop the things that Jewish Christians will find most offensive. We're not saying you have to become a Jew to become a Christian. But at the same time, don't do things that would make a Jewish Christian want to, to leave the room. So eating food with blood in it and uh, all the other things that are mentioned here were activities associated with a pagan temple. And as such, they were strictly non-kosher for the Jewish believer. So Gentile Christians, don't do something that would cause your Jewish Christian brothers and sisters to stumble. This is going to be an issue in the early church in, in, in all kinds of ways. Uh, it's mentioned, for example, in Romans chapter 14, where Paul is addressing a church that is a mix of Jewish and Gentile background believers. And Romans 14 and verse 19, this is what Paul says. He says, let, it, let us therefore make every effort to do what leads to peace and to mutual edification. Do not destroy the work of God for the sake of food. All food is clean, but it is wrong for a man to eat anything that causes someone else to stumble. It is better not to eat meat or drink wine or to do anything else that will cause your brother to fall. So this is the principle. Don't do anything that's going to cause another brother or sister to stumble. The unity of the church is more important than your personal freedom. And you see back in Acts 15 how the, the church in Antioch respond. They are glad. They are glad for its encouraging message. And they're glad to restrict themselves for the sake of other people. And the same applies to the church today. It's not issue, about issues of, of food sacrifice to idols that may be at stake. But still in our churches, there are things that we do, things that we hold very dear, which may threaten to pull us apart. But we're to still cultivate that basic attitude of aiming to live in harmony with one another. And therefore making sacrifices for the sake of the church. So it could be to do with the way that what we eat, whether we're a vegetarian or vegan, 
or what we drink, whether we're teetotal or not. Whatever our personal convictions, we're not to impose those things on other believers as though they were gospel issues. It may be things like the timing and the, the manner of baptism that we have differences on, or the style of music we prefer. But the unity of the church is so much more important than those things, so that none of those things should be allowed to divide us. So pre preserve the unity of the church. That's what this is all about. Protect the truth of the gospel. A church living in the light of Pentecost must take that very seriously because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. So protect the gospel by preaching salvation by grace alone through faith, faith alone in Christ alone. And preach it that to your own heart. Every day I need to hear the gospel. That it is not what I do that puts me in a right relationship with God. It is all about what the Lord Jesus has done. Preach that gospel to yourself every day. Do not add to the gospel because a gospel plus is a gospel minus. But also a church living in the light of Pentecost must take seriously our fellowship with one another. It's wonderful that we come from different backgrounds, from different nationalities. And great too that we have different convictions on secondary issues like alcohol or vegetarianism or whatever it may be but we're not to cause one another to stumble and even if we free, feel free to do certain things we're not to impose that freedom on others in a way that would offend their conscience as paul says the kingdom of god is so much bigger than what we eat or drink the holy spirit is the spirit whose fruit is love as we reminded in our prayer so love one another protect the unity of the church protect the truth of the gospel let's pray together heavenly father we thank you that it is by grace alone that we are saved and we thank you for the Pentecost promise, which we see being worked out here in Jerusalem and Antioch. And as we see it too being fulfilled in our own lives, in our own churches here in Blackburn. Please, we pray, may we be churches where the truth of the gospel is not left unsaid. Please, we pray, keep us proclaiming that truth to one another, to ourselves. And please, we pray, may we be churches which take love for one another so seriously that we will not offend one another by carelessly um, offending others, but rather counting each other better than, than ourselves will serve one another and seek to live well with one another, whatever our convictions on secondary issues. And we pray this all for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.